You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Sarah Bladel on the show with me. She has an amazing new book. It's called A Harmless Lie, and this is an absolute must-have for your uh, for that table beside your reading chair when you just want to sink into a story and get completely lost. Uh, welcome to the show, Sarah. Sarah, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? I can I can tell you that I have never dreamt about being a writer. It has really? never been. Yeah, it, it sounds it sounds ridiculous now so many years after I know that. But the thing is that uh, actually I'm dyslexic, dyslexic. Uh, so reading and writing was not not a favorite thing for me until until I uh, as a child start reading uh, or my my parents start uh, reading um, uh, mysteries for children for example uh, Inet Blyton's The Famous Five and Nancy Drew and that kind of stuff and when as as a dyslexic dyslexic child the thing about a mystery is that you have a motor in the story. You have to find out what is going on. You have to find out if they will solve it. And I saw myself uh, as one of these children. I was so into it. So it it tricked me into becoming a, a reader uh, in that way that was really amazing for me because I find a place to be and a room to be in. So for me, books have been a very huge uh, thing in my childhood, even that it wasn't easy for me. But the whole idea about books is that someone else is writing them. I I didn't have uh, I didn't I didn't ha- see myself of, of becoming a writer. But I'm uh, my my father was a very well known journalist in Denmark, and uh, his father was a very well known journalist. So I mean, it's so much in the family's blood that they become writers. So every time. I was asked, oh, Sarah, are you, do you want to become a journalist or a writer? Uh, I was asked when I was a child, I was just like, no, no way. <laughs> I'm, I'm an educated waiter in uh, one of our very, very good restaurants in, in Denmark. And, and so I, I, I saw myself being an absolutely anything else but a writer. So it wasn't in my plans. I uh, I also um, struggle with dyslexia, and as a as a child, I remember being so frustrated um, reading that that I would I would start to get immersed in a story, and then the words would would just trip me up as, as I read it. And and uh, you know a, as you you grow and you go through school, I, I learned little tricks that would that would help me. And and then reading became. Um, something that that actually kind of gave me comfort through mm-hmm. through that time in a weird way people just assume that if you have dyslexia it's just you know you you run from books mm-hmm. and, and it's not quite like that it's uh when you when you sort of begin to crack the code a little bit uh, there's a lot of comfort that comes from books I totally agree i couldn't say it more clearly it's exactly the same way i felt because it was a room to walk into it, all the yes. stories, all the things that I could imagine and I could see myself in. And someone once told me that, OK, of course, it's a, a book can be uh, it can be a mirror where you can see yourself or a window where you can look into someone else's life. And for me, the dyslexia was also um, a part of being insecure because Hank, you will you will remember in school when when you were asked to read out loud when you have your homework oh, I and I hated, I hated it. it too. I mean, I was 
I was so sick and, and I was really pre I was really, really doing my homework. So it was not because I was lazy or anything like that, but I hated it every time when it was my turn to read out. So it could have killed all the joy about reading, uh, but it didn't because as you described it before, it was a place to walk into and it gave me a lot of comfort to be there. But of course, only in the stories that I decided I like to be in. Um, you you talked about your early love of Nancy Drew and, and uh, other mysteries. What was it about mystery stories that really captured your imagination? That was uh, it. It was. I mean, the suspense of will they find them? They out in the lighthouse. They are light in uh, at some point where there shouldn't be light, and they run out there. It was suspense, and it was exciting, and it was also a little bit dangerous. And they were brave, and they took chances. And I think that was it. Was a lot of things that I wish that I could do <laughs> myself. Um, I grew up. I grew up. Uh, in, in the on the in the countryside, and uh, our uh, it was a little uh, yeah, a, far, a little farm you can say you can call it a little farm very close to the wood, and I was spying every Sunday on the cars that pass our house because I was sure that there was a body in the trunk or <laughs> they were driving in for hiding something or they have kidnapped. I mean. So much was going on in my head. And sometimes I was running after just to solve what was happening and going going on. And I know for a fact if actually if there was a body in a trunk of one of these cars or if someone else something else was happening, I would have died of fear. I mean, drop dead of fear. But 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 imagine things and be in it and entertain yourself and come up with what what if dot, 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 then I could could continue the story. It was just a wonderful place for me to be. So from from being um, uh, an educated waiter, as you described yourself, um, what, what was the the impetus to write that first book? Um, you know that a lot of people, um, love books and love stories and, and sort of see themselves as storytellers. But there's usually something that that takes you from a lover of books to deciding one day, you know, I, I'm going to try my hand at this. Maybe no one will ever see it. Maybe it'll just be for my own entertainment. But there's a story idea that comes that just won't leave you alone. Um, wh what was that? What was that first story like for you? Um, for at that point, I was uh, I was I, I've been working as a journalist for many years, and you know about deadlines and the stress coming up when you're reaching a deadline or you have to sure. finish a show, all that kind of stuff. And I uh, I created a space in my head where I start telling myself a story. So when people were yelling and shouting around me, I just I didn't close my eyes so they couldn't see that I wasn't listening. I was just in in my story, and that was exactly the same as a as I did when I was a child. What if, here it was, what if a Danish journalist had, uh, was murdered and was placed behind a hotel and blah, blah, blah. It wasn't not very interesting or very ordinary, ordinary, but I had a space to create my own story just for me, just for fun. I did not plan it to be a book. I didn't even see it coming that it should be a book one day. But at one point, maybe three or four months into that uh, into I've started that game of my own my own brain game or what you can call it. Um, I was so curious about it. I could see I've met Louise Rick. She's my protagonist, uh, and I knew exactly how she looked, and I knew that she was working at the homicide department in Copenhagen. But I've never been arrested. I've never been placed in the homicide department, and thank God for that. <laughs> thank <laughs> that, God. That, that, that was that's good. Um, but I couldn't see it, and I think maybe that is also a little bit of, related to my dyslexia, that I need to see things. I, I mean, I when I'm writing, I see it in like scenes that I am into it, like a film, like a movie. Um, and I could not create the homicide department because I've never been there and I couldn't imagine how it looked like. And I was not specifically interested in 
in oh it, I wasn't interested in specific cases, but I was interested in the daily life there. Where do they park your bicycle? Because in Copenhagen, you know, everyone is riding a bicycle. And um, and how is the lunch and all the details that you will know if you work there. And uh, it, one day I, I, I wrote a totally old school letter to the former uh, chief of the homicide department and uh, told him that I was uh, writing on a book going on in his department if it were uh, and asked if it was possible for me to come and visit. I mean, I was not working on a book. It was just in my <laughs> head and it was it, I don't know what I what what grabbed me, but I didn't I didn't expect that he would call me, but he called me the next day and invited me in. And that was the moment where I knew I was working on a book, because when when the door opens, the research door opens to uh, the homicide department and I was invited in and and they 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 helped me create the the yeah the setting around Louis Rigg, then I knew I I was trying I, I I would try to write it. But Hank, at that point I um, I had uh, in '93 I founded my own publishing house in Denmark, only publishing crime fiction, and that was way way long before any uh, Scandinavian crime fiction wave. So it was a very stupid uh, time to, to start a publishing house. I should have waited. But um, I knew for a fact that overnight success is happens very rarely. I mean, it happens almost never. Uh, so I knew uh, if I, if I sh uh, should uh, <laughs> succeed with finishing a book, I maybe could expect that 10 people would read it or 12 or 15 or 50 maybe. I mean, my expectations was just, I was just happy if I succeed finishing it. I didn't, I didn't see it come out. I didn't see a series. I didn't, I didn't expect it to be a huge thing. So I think it helped me because it did not put a pressure on me when I was writing it. I, I, I was writing it for my, for, for me, for my own sake. And and that's where the real passion comes from. When when you when you find a story that you're passionate about, and and you know maybe it's only ten people that ever read it, but but you told the story, mm. and and out of that passion is where uh, a great writing career comes from. A lot of times. I'm glad that you say that because that was what happened here. I mean, it was it it was for me, and it was right. fun. And I so, think, yeah, sorry. So, so you've uh, alluded uh, a couple of times to your home country of Denmark, um, and and you have a, a beautiful accent. Um, mm -hmm. So your your writing career began in Denmark, and and like you said a minute ago, that there's such a great um, uh, crime fiction scene in in Scandinavia that that has you know we've got Lars Kepler and you know others that have you know just really made waves. Um, when when you published that first story and and began to find an audience, did did it surprise you that that people were were interested in the same kinds of stories that you were? Yes, uh, I think it I think it did because I. I was not an overnight success, I have to say. I mean, it starts slowly, but my second book, it uh, it it kind of was my break here in Denmark, and then it was sold to start being sold to other countries. And what hit me mostly was, for example, that I have readers in Hungary or yeah, in other countries that could never know anything about my life here in Copenhagen or specific later on my life where I, I grew up in some of my, um, I have a, a book uh, called The Forgotten Girls that is written in um, about a, a small town in Sjælland, yeah, an hour drive from, from Copenhagen. And I mean, it is, to begin with, it was so weird for me to understand that people outside Denmark would find it interesting to be with me in my story going on very local here in Denmark. And that that amazed me still. I mean, still when I when I have um, I have some of my uh, foreign books uh, sent by from my agent, it's like, 
how can they be interested in a small town outside Copenhagen? How can they be interested? And that it fascinates me and it, it makes me so grateful because still, I mean, still, I've been a writer for a long time now, but still I write for my I tell the story for me. I'm, yeah. I never have the feeling that uh, I cannot feel the audience when I'm writing. Uh, does that make sense? I mean, I, I write it for me because I'm sure. curious. Right. I'm curious to see how this will, uh, how can I deliver my story to, to the paper? How can I put it down? How can they say and feel and do what I feel in my head that they should? And it's not before the, I, I got the book in my hand from my publisher, I start thinking about, oops, do they will they like it or how how would they react to the story? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's good. Otherwise, I'd probably be thinking way too much about it. Things We Never Got Over, the new book by best-selling author Lucy Score. Bearded bad boy Barber Knox refers to live his life the way he takes his coffee, alone, unless you count his basset hound Waylon. Knox doesn't tolerate drama even when it comes in the form of a stranded runaway bride. Naomi wasn't just running away from her wedding. She was riding to the rescue of her estranged twin to knock him out Virginia, a rough around the edges town where disputes are settled the old fashioned way with fist and beer, usually in that order. Too bad for Naomi, her evil twin hasn't changed at all. After helping herself to Naomi's car and cash, Tina leaves her with something unexpected the niece Naomi didn't know she had. Now she's stuck in town with no car, no job, no plan, and no home with an 11-year-old going on 30 to take care of. There's a reason Knox doesn't do complications or high-maintenance women, especially not the romantic ones. But since Naomi's life imploded right in front of him, the least he can do is help her out of her jam. And just as soon as she stops getting into new trouble, he can leave her alone and get back to his peaceful, solitary life. At least that's the plan until the trouble turns to real danger. Things We Never Got Over, the new book by best-selling author, Lucy Score. An Innocent Client, the first book in the Joe Dillard legal thriller series. A preacher is found brutally murdered in a Tennessee motel room. A beautiful, mysterious young girl is accused. In this best-selling debut, criminal defense lawyer Joe Dillard has become jaded over the years as he's tried to balance his career against his conscience. Savvy but cynical, Dillard wants to quit doing criminal defense, but he can't resist the chance to represent someone who might actually be innocent. His drug-addicted sister has just been released from prison, and his mother is succumbing to Alzheimer's, but Dillard's commitment to the case never wavers despite the personal troubles and professional demands that threaten to destroy him. Chosen by BookBub readers as one of the top 100 crime novels of all time, get started on this great series with an innocent client where it all started. Read for free with Kindle Unlimited or buy it in paperback or audiobook. An Innocent Client by Scott Pratt. I think a healthy skepticism is, is good. It, I think it's good to to have those butterflies of, uh, you know, will anyone like it? I, I think mm -hmm. if you go in just assuming that, you know, this is going to be the thing that changes literature forever and, <laughs> yeah. and people are going to love me, um, <laughs> you, maybe you're setting yourself up for failure. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I, oh, and pressure also. <laughs> right. Absolutely. No, yeah. Um, is English your your native language? Oh no, 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 Danish, no, no. And I'm sorry if it's if it's difficult to understand. No, 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 not at all. You um, you 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 speak beautiful English. Um, <laughs> but but uh, the reason I ask is, um, do you do you write in in Danish or yeah. do you write in English? I write in Danish, and then uh, I have a, a translator, of course, and a great translator, I think, and. And between my, uh, I also have a very, very great uh, editor in the US, but between my translator and my editor, I have, and that was very new for me when my books start uh, being published on the American market, that I have a book doctor. Um, I have not, I have never heard about it. And that is, she is the cleverest and the smartest in the whole process because she is the one 
who um, who can act, if you can say so, if who can act like me, uh, doing the the work with the manuscript uh, between uh, the translator and the and the editor, because she can go in and do all the things that I work with in my Danish manuscript, because I know my language and I know the details in the language, and I will not repeat the same words. And I mean, translation can go so wrong, not just words or stories, <laughs> but it can be so obvious that it's a translation. Right. Uh, and that can really harm the, the the story. So I'm so grateful for uh, for my book doctor because she, we, she have, first of all, spent a lot of time with me. We have discussed a lot of small details, how things look like in Copenhagen. I sent her pictures if we need to describe it more in more detail or and uh, and I lived in in New York for, for a couple of years, and we met very often. So she know my language, she knows me, and I feel that it is extremely helpful for the book that that it's uh, not just translated, but I have one to work with the language. Have Have you found anything in the translation of your works that that just didn't translate, that didn't carry over? Maybe it's a you know a euphemism or or some um saying or something that uh you know that that makes sense in Denmark but for maybe an American audience there's just something lost do you, do you ever run into little cultural things like that that you know maybe it's not a language you know word mm. for word that that gets mis mixed up but uh something about the culture that just doesn't carry over I I'm, I'm totally sure that uh, that uh, there has been these kind of issues my uh my English isn't good enough to catch that uh, these kind of things, but I'm I'm totally sure that it must be because I use it in in Danish because I I like it to be uh, when I write in Danish I like to to put my story and the dialogue close to how we talk. I mean, so I do not think about how will this translate, but that is the reason that I have my book doctor because she will know how to convert it into the American way to say the exact, exact same thing. But of course, in another, how you will do it, uh, how you will uh, paint the picture uh, instead of the way that I'll do it. And that is extremely helpful. But I mean, translation can go so, so wrong. Uh, uh, it, it could be in some book. I mean, when, when, when I see some of my books translated uh, in, in some countries, it, it, it will expand and be enormously thick. And in other countries, the same story would be a, a thin one. And I say, okay, who decides what to put into it and what to take out? But I had one specific um, memory of when I I was published in Germany, and I I had I, I was invited to Berlin to do a speech at the university in Berlin, and right before I went on stage, a Danish woman who works there, uh, a professor, she came up to me and said, "Oh, Sarah, I just want." Uh, I, w I just want to let you know that um, no, she was a teacher that our professor asked me right before I was going to meet you, is it Sarah who writes so poorly or is it the translation? Oh, <laughs> welcome to Germany, Sarah. And then, and then the, the Danish woman said, uh, but I told him that I've been reading all your books in Denmark. So I knew that you were writing brilliant. So the translator, he was the one to blame. But that was not very funny, and um, and it is a funny story, but it was not very funny to stand there ten, two minutes on going on stage, knowing that it was horrible, and then we have to change the publisher because I mean you have to trust them. Right, right. Well, a harmless lie um, is is just nearly perfect. It uh, you don't know that it's a translation at all, and it just completely pulls you into the story just uh, immediately. Um, I have to ask you, Detective Louise Rick, uh, where did where did Louise come from? How how did she show up on the scene for you? She was the first I met, you know, when when I didn't know it was a book, when when I when I just have this space in my head and created this, the first story, I could see her so clearly. And I I thought at just to, to use an, an American way to say it, I thought that she was a tough cookie. So I start creating her like being one, I mean, 
being on top of everything, able to handle uh, everything. And I, I saw her very, very clearly, uh, and I knew that she was very professional. And I started writing the first novel, and I think I was two or three, no, two pages into it when she had a nervous breakdown. And that surprised me big time because she she was so she was so clear in my head and um i put i did not plan to put in a flashback that goes to the first time where she had to go out and um and, and tell a young woman that her boyfriend was knocked down on the street and it was so serious so he was killed of the attack by the attack and in that situation standing there for the first time in your career telling another person that that the man that the guy she really loved is dead that turns back to her so strong that she couldn't deal with it and after i've been writing that scene i was like sarah where did that come from you've built up a strong female character and you are have you haven't even stepped into the story you've just started it and then everything went wrong and she couldn't bear it and we have to send her to a cycle that was so weird um yeah, yeah but but it, that was totally a surprise and i know of course i could just press my finger and delete and i could build up a strong female character but I didn't do that because I was like, OK, that is who you are. OK, we have to deal with it and we have to cope with, with it in some way. And before I handled my manuscript into my editor, I was talking to the former chief of the homicide department and telling him about it. And just to say, OK, how would you react if this actually happened, if that was her first reaction in that situation? And he looked at me and said, but Sarah, if she did not react like that, she will never have a job in my department because I need people with empathy. I need my best um, investigator, my best detectives here. They have empathy. That is why they are very good at the job. I was like, oh, yes. But it surprised me. I bet. Um, the the title of this book, A Harmless Lie, is is sort of a play on words and you – you when you see the book and you read the title, um, you almost immediately mistrust. Um, the, like a, a a harmless lie is uh is kind of an oxymoron. You know, um, we we're taught from a very early age to always tell the truth and that it's important that the truth must always, you know, no matter what the consequences are, we, you know, that that there are there's really no such thing as a harmless lie. Um. What does this title mean to you? One of the things that that uh, brought me into the story was the, was uh, memories of my own uh, uh, teenage life. In Denmark, it's very common that we go on school trips when we are um, around 13 years old, uh, just turn teenagers, and then we go away for a week or five days, and we go on uh, on many of us go on on a small island called Bornholm. It's between Denmark and Sweden. And one of the things that um, started me thinking was that when, when you are a teenager and you don't want your parents to know exactly what you're doing because you have to do something that you don't tell them. That's very obvious. That, that it, it happens a lot, I know. Um, and when I was thinking about consequences, consequences is so different for a teenager than for an adult and consequences can be absolutely innocent i mean it could be nothing but what seems like being the worst thing ever for a teenager for example if you jump out the window to meet some local boys the thing is not that you jumped out of the window. The thing is, please do not tell my parents because then I will be <laughs> sent back from the from this trip. Please do not tell them what happened or don't let them know. I, I'd better say that I was not there or I didn't see anything. I didn't do anything. I will not be the one who is sent back to my parents and cannot enjoy the rest of this trip. 
that seems very innocent and and harmless but right. seen with adult eyes it could be much more interesting to know i mean we have to know what happened when you jump out the window it's not like it's not important if you are sent home or not it's important what happened and that is fascinating and that is interesting because the way that you look at things as a teenager or as an adult is very different so uh, a harmless lie is not the first book that has featured louise is it no it's actually and it, it, please do not scare people away because it's actually book number 10 in the series but it's a very good place to start i have um, i've had a, a break from her uh, when i was uh, writing uh, the family series it's a trilogy going on in the us and uh, i i wasn't sure if i would pick up louise rick again because um, it it depends on which story that showed up in my head but uh, in a harmless lie it felt very natural to bring her back because I'm bringing her back in another way. I'm bringing her back as a private person. She is in the story because of her brother and her sister-in-law. She is not in the story um, because she is uh, leading the investigation of this case. And that feels like a new beginning. So if you haven't read any of my previous books, it's a good place to start. Well, I was going to say when I read the book, um, I didn't know that it was part of a series until after the fact, and and I didn't feel, uh, you know how sometimes you'll you'll get into a long running series and there's um, there's so much information that the that the writer just you know takes for granted that the reader is mm -hmm. going to know and and it's almost like like there's some inside jokes that you just don't get, you know, mm. and you're just, you're kind of confused, but you don't get that at all in this book. When you say it's, it's a great place to jump into the series. It absolutely is. Um, do you have, do you have plans for this character going forward? Will there be more books with Louise? Actually? Yes. And I didn't know that when, when I start writing a harmless life, but I knew it, I, I saw it coming uh, when when I was over the middle of it, I, I think, because I've created a new uh, unit, a new uh, task force that she is leading. It's called P13. It's because we have uh, 12 police districts in Denmark and uh, and P is yeah the police district. Uh, and this 13 is a it's a, it's a task force where they have special skills to investigate, for example, homicide or uh, missing people or whatever it might be. But the important thing for me creating this new task force was that I was able to send her everywhere in Denmark. She was not locked to investigate only one kind of of uh, crime. She can she can travel she can travel around the country and dig into all these kind of stuff that the author behind her wants to know more about. So I uh, I have just started up a new, yeah, a Louis Rick part two, you can say that, or volume two. I love it. I can't wait to see where you take this character, but I also can't wait to dig into the back catalog and, and figure out all the things that I've missed about Louise already. Um, I, I, I can't wait until they all come to the States and, and we get to uh, get a glimpse into those. Um, Sarah, if people are, are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, is there a place online where they can but, find you, connect with you and dig into all the stuff that you do? Yes. And actually, all of my books is published in the U.S., so you can Fantastic. go and find all of them and they can uh, they can meet me and find me on Instagram uh, and on Twitter. And my name is just at Sarah Bladel. Great. And we'll put links in the show notes where people can grab A Harmless Lie in Kindle edition or hardcover or audio book. Uh, however you like to consume books, you can grab it today or go visit your local bookstore. And uh, if they don't have it in stock, get them to order Sarah Bladel, uh, A Harmless Lie. Sarah, this has been so much fun chatting. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was really a pleasure. Thank you so very much. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Glebe's The Jason Crane Series. Welcome to historic Sleepy Hollow, settled in 1640. Jason had looped around the town and had come up Broadway from the south. 
Behind the retaining wall next to the sign, a yard worker turned on his leaf blower, sending a tidal wave of yellow and red up and over the stones to splash off the windshield of the RV. They passed antique shops, a shell station, and a Food King grocery. This is the same Broadway, you know, said Eliza. It goes all the way down to Times Square. Used to be an Indian trail, Manhattan to Fort Orange, for the fur trapping business. She kissed the dog. Oh, don't worry, baby, nobody's going to skin you. And you know what the town's most famous for? Well, duh, Jason said. Every kid named Crane, especially one as tall and skinny as Jason, had heard a lifetime of Ichabod jokes. He hoped never to hear another. Did you know it was a real place? Of course, he said, though he hadn't. Don't be so smart, said Eliza. Turn here. The streets sloped towards the Hudson, the hillside trying to shake the village off its back. Jason slipped in behind a UPS truck and drove upwards. They turned onto Gory Brook Road. He stuck his head out the window, trying to pass. The UPS truck turned aside to the right. And he saw the house. Here! 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 said Eliza. She pointed at the driveway of 417 Gory Brook. Jason brought the RV to a smoke-belching halt. The house stood on a knoll, above a steep yard that angled downwards toward the Hudson. An ancient sycamore on the front lawn leaned precariously. The roof was an irregular A-frame, with a long slope on the left and a short one on the right, like a rotated checkmark. The upper floors were trimmed with bands of chocolate brown wood in a rectangular pattern. They made the house look as if it were trapped behind the bars of a jail cell. A tiny triangular portico extended over the front door, which was rough-hewn, rounded on top, held together by two vertical metal bands, and dotted with nail heads, a gothic novel in braille. The gray-blue curtains at the ground floor bay window gave the place a veiled eye aspect, like his grandmother's cataracts. The house seemed to be inspecting Jason with that eye. What are you doing here, boy? I'm watching you. Eliza put a hand on his shoulder. He jumped. This is it, she said. She slapped the dashboard. This is what? Our new home. But... Jason turned to her, baffled. Her face sparkled with delight. Surprise! Surprise!